welcome to the Industry Angel Podcast. We hear from the best business minds across the globe, entrepreneurs, social influencers, marketing mavens, and sales rock stars. We've got them all. Here comes your weekly dose of inspiration with your host, Ian Farah. Welcome to episode 99 of the Industry Angel. I am looking forward to celebrating the century. Next week, August 14th, with you here in South Shields. Free tickets, remember, via industryangel.com. We'll be live streaming, of course, for our listeners further afield. Don't you worry. So we've got a great founder's journey for you on this episode. So let's hear from today's guest. Today we are joined by the CEO and founder of the Recipe Box Delivery Company, Gusto. Welcome to the Industry Angel, Timo Bold. Ian, thanks a lot for having me. Delighted to be here. Great to have you with us, Timo. But where, where are you speaking to us from? I'm actually in London today. In London, so well, hot I'm in the day. northeast, so it's, it's what a hot day. 31 degrees in London, yep. Is it really? We're, 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 a bit, we're a bit cloudy up here further north, and I'm on the coast as well, so it's always a little bit cloudy. So, Timo, before we dive in to the Gusto journey, I'd love to hear a quick background to maybe yourself. Is that okay? Yeah, certainly. Absolutely. Uh, as you can tell, I'm German. I've lived in the UK for 11 years. I'm married. I've got a, a very young child. Uh, I love this place. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, before I lived in the UK, I lived in California for a couple of years um, in, in Napa Valley. Fantastic for food. This is where kind of my passion for food comes from. I've got family in the wine trade, in the organic um, kind of food trade. Uh, and then before that, I lived in Germany. So I've left Germany 15 years ago, uh, have been in the US and the UK now. Uh, massive, massive passion for food. Uh, and uh, as one did back in 2007, I started my career in finance, um, somehow magically ended up in London uh, by chance. Uh, and then after a couple of years in finance, uh, no kids, no mortgage, you know, decided to quit my job and start Gusto. Uh, and the mission was and is today to reduce food waste whilst making lives easier, better and more healthy uh, for families across all of the UK. Fantastic. I love that mission. So basically a recipe box company, do you, that's kind of how I introduced you. Would you tell us exactly what that means? Sure. Um, a billion meals are eaten in the UK. Certainly you and I have dinner and lunch every single day. So it's a very, it's a huge market. Everyone is eating. And, and our mission is, is really simple, just to make your life easier and better and more healthy by you, by letting you choose from a menu of over 30 recipes so that you, you know, find whatever you love to eat. And then we send you all the exact ingredients pre-proportioned, giving you a recipe card. So it's super easy for anyone to cook amazing recipes. If you're time poor, you know, maybe have a 10 to table recipe that only takes 10 minutes or maybe have a family classic or go all in on a Saturday and cook for 90 minutes. But, you know, it's your choice. Uh, it's super easy. Anyone can do it. Uh, pricing is from two ninety eight per meal, including free delivery across all of the UK. Uh, so it, it literally takes away all the hassle from cooking and lets you uh, enjoy cooking and, and spending time with your better half or family. So, Timo, you were in finance, and then suddenly now you become into recipes and cooking. Did did you cook? Are you a bit of a foodie, Timo? Do you actually get get the pots and pans out and go for it yourself? I absolutely love to cook. Uh, I still cook four times a week. I'm a paying gusto customer, uh, <laughs> and you know it's it's gotten a lot better since other people are developing the recipes. To be fair, um, and we have a professionalized team doing that, not me anymore. But no, I, I six years ago I wanted to solve my own issue. I didn't have the time, uh, and even if I had the time. Uh, I lived next to a food market, so I went to the market, I bought all the ingredients, it took me forever to look up ingredients, and then I ended up having lots and lots of food waste because I worked insanely long hours. Um, so I just realized, you know, there are lots of people like myself, uh, we're all competitively busy in, in today's world, 
and supermarkets for the last 50 years have built a supply chain that for the next 50 years is no longer fit for purpose, i.e. you and I want to you know, click on a picture whilst we're on a bus uh, or at the gym. And we want to get stuff delivered uh, in, the, in the most convenient possible way, allowing us to create absolutely tasty, delicious, yet healthy recipes. Um, so I think there is a huge change in consumer preferences um, and obviously convenience and online are huge trends, but at the same time, health and sustainability matter the world. So we're ticking all those four mega trends in the grocery industry. Uh, uh, definitely. And what does it look like now, Timo, in terms of numbers? You know, what, what staff levels have we got at the moment? So we are uh, close to 400 people. Uh, when I started the company six years ago, <laughs> we, we launched this in my living room. Um, you know, I, we did sourcing at the local farmer's market and we literally went there every single morning at kind of 7, 8 a.m. Uh, we did the repackaging. Um, so very, very humble beginnings. Uh, and then it somehow magically scaled over time. Lots of lots of hard work uh, and just absolutely amazing people. Today, the business you know has close to four hundred people, so we have tremendously professionalized the business. For four years, I've been an entrepreneur. For the last two years, I, I'm a CEO. The jury is still out. I'm tremendously enjoying it, but um, but it's it's just mind blowingly fun working with such uh, exceptional people uh, as as I do. That's that's my biggest privilege. Yeah, it sounds like it. I'm going to drill into the people a bit later on. I just want to wind it back a little bit. So you mentioned you started in your living room, but didn't you go on Dragon's Den, Timo? I did. I did. Yeah, good good fun. Uh, yeah. you know, little a shark, cross. shark tank for our US listeners. <laughs> yeah, a little cross on the floor, you know, a little mark where you have to stand and then they videotape you for two hours and then they cut it down to the moments where you're most red-faced and sweaty. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a weird, fun, but also quite scary experience. Uh, we did receive two offers. For whatever reason, they only showed one offer on the show. Uh, and we decided not to take any of the offers because we had a better offer from a group of angel investors. Um, and we just didn't feel like it makes any sense to, um, you know, uh, dilute us at this stage. What was it like when you knocked them back, Timo? Uh, <laughs> just really, really fascinating, really fascinating. I think they really missed out. Um, it would have been fun to get them involved. Uh, but yeah. Mind-blowing experience back then because we were such a tiny business, and we did actually, to our surprise, we we saw a huge spike in orders uh, after Dragon's Den, um, which caught us by surprise and and crashed the website, uh, but helped us a lot in hindsight. Yeah, great stuff. So, so some good PR, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you, you mentioned um, a little bit about food wastage, and I know you're really passionate about that. So, how? Could you tell me a little bit about that? Like, how do you kind of ensure that that's always in the forefront of, of Gusto? Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, a couple of points about food waste and, and, and you know, it, it's just one of the saddest realities uh, we face in today's society. Uh, there are billions of people in the world who live from less than a dollar per day and they can't afford to eat on a daily basis. Whilst in the UK and in the US and Germany and France, we have a surplus of food. Uh, so we end up wasting a ton of food. Um, and the current supply ch side, um, so supermarkets, uh, just by definition waste food because one, you know, there's the farm and then there's the wholesaler and then there's the, um, the Unilever or the food processor or the, the craft. Uh, and then there is kind of the Tesco. Uh, and two, you have to push food into 10,000s of stores all across the country, which by definition means not everything will be fresh once it hits shelves and so on. So 66% of all salads in the UK are wasted, um, which is just an absolute tragedy. Uh, so, so we early on made this our core mission. How do we, get, how do we come up with a business model that reduces food waste to 0%? That's been the North uh, Star since we started. And uh, w obviously what we, what we do to the customers, we give customers the exact proportion. So you should never, ever waste any food. Theoretically, you should have zero food waste thanks to using Gusto. And then in the supply chain, um, we are currently wasting close to 0.2% of food, which is ridiculously low 
and uh, an absolute fraction to what supermarkets are wasting. Uh, it's it's fairly normal for lots of types of food to waste up to 70% of items. Um, so it's a dramatic reduction in food waste. The team is absolutely obsessed to get it even close um, uh, down further. Uh, and over time, what has really kind of been a catalyst is how we leverage technology. So we've learned how to apply AI to forecasting, how to build our own systems and tools so that we don't place huge orders and then waste food, but that we kind of become extremely clever, you know, place a 90% order, then place a top-up order last minute, uh, and so on. But um, we've, we've tremendously invested into uh, brains uh, solving this problem. Uh, and it's quite, quite fun kind of seeing the team succeed. That's some staggering figures there. And I was really interested in the tech bit there. So in terms of forecasting what you guys would need, you must have a really tight supply chain. So you must keep those that supply chain really tight and close to you. Do you, do you speak to them often, Timo? Yes, a lot. Uh, so I, I had the immense pleasure of just meeting uh, last month, uh, meeting 120 suppliers. We organized a big supplier conference. We invited everyone. 60 supply, suppliers showed up uh, and 120 people from those 60 suppliers. So, uh, uh, you know, every single kind of farmer that has a large farm in the UK pretty much attended. Uh, fishmongers, um, artisan bakeries, Really, really amazing. And the key topic was how do we innovate in the future? How do we partner long term with farmers so that, you know, they at no extra cost reduce plastic packaging, for example? How do they come up with product innovation so that our customers benefit? We've done a ton of workshops, full day, entire team. We did show cooking, immensely fun. And, and already now, a couple of weeks after the, the, the big meetup, uh, you know, we're receiving amazing emails from suppliers saying, hey, we can reduce this plastic. We, we can give you better quality on this and this. Um, it's, I think it's all about creating a strategic alliance with the people that matter the most and treating them as your core partners uh, and investing heavily into the relationship rather than squeezing people on cost, which is pretty one-dimensional. And our business model is all about innovation. So it has to be, you know, innovation-led, creative-led, uh, quality focus. You mentioned partnerships there, and that's exactly what was going through my mind when, when you were speaking there. And even having a large number of suppliers that you call partners is so rewarding and reassuring to me. So what about the sustainability then? So, you know, your your partners, do, do you... Um, do you push anything onto them in terms of what you need from a partner? You know, like you must be sustainable. You must do this. You must do that. You know, you're not going to work with anybody, Timo. Do they have to hit certain criteria to work with Gusto? Um, yes, no, absolutely. We have our scorecard, which yeah. heavily, you know, includes sustainability metrics. And, and our big pledge for the next 12 months is to reduce uh, plastic in our boxes by 50% which is hugely ambitious and really means that we can't do it on our own. We need every single supplier to work with us to come up with fantastic solutions. Ultimately, plastic has a huge purpose in this world. Meat, for example, has to be in plastic. Otherwise, it goes off. Um, so no one in the world has found a solution for, for how to package pl uh, meat. Um, but we're really trying to push the boundaries our team coming up with ideas, but then heavily depending on suppliers to actually run with the idea and, and see the win-win opportunity. A lot of times what I find amazing is, is that if you reduce plastic, you actually save cost. So it's win-win for suppliers, for us, for our customers, for, for, for the environment. Um, it's, it's really, really fun, uh, but lots of ambition and lots of challenges. I think in total, the team is executing 19 projects to reduce plastic over the next year. Uh, so a ton of ambition and serious, serious execution ability put behind that ambition. You've mentioned there, you know, environmental issues, sustainability, food wastage. Amazing. And I love you know, the, the ethos behind the company. One thing that's sticking in my mind now is that Whenever you have something like this, you'll have investors or you'll have a board who are who are pushing for numbers, Timo. You've you've you, you probably <laughs> you, you've probably felt this yourself. You know, it's all about numbers sometimes, and then you've got the you're the side of the seesaw saying yes, but we've got all these values, and, and, you know, trying to balance it out. 
So my question to you is, do you have mentors? Do you have a, a board that are, um, that, that are pressurizing you a little bit on this? No, I'm, I'm, so I'm tremendously blessed by having uh, a list of investors who believe in the long-term vision. Overnight success takes 10 years. It, it takes time to build you know, big household brands that consumers love, and that have sustainable impact on the world and on, on customers. And I think everyone around the, the shareholder table is completely aligned with what we're trying to achieve. Our customers are buying Gusto you know, to some degree, obviously for convenience reasons, but to a large extent uh, for its sustainability mission. So it does sit at the core of what we're doing. It's at the core of the business model. I think a lot of times it's a um, false dichotomy to think it's it's one or the other. As I said before, if you reduce plastic, you actually save money, which is win-win for everyone and delights shareholders. Um but no, I'm, I'm, I'm tremendously blessed. I, I consider all my shareholders as, as mentors, as, as partners. I learn something from every, every single person. Um, and I'm very delighted how supportive they've been on this journey. Fantastic. I've got a big smile on my face now you said that. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go back to people, Timo, because we've got formed at staff there now. So obviously you've grew from, you know, five or six years ago from, from the living room with things like formed at staff. It be, there's HR issues there. The, 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 there's, <laughs> the, there's people issues there. It, it's tough. Um, I'd, I'd love to know how you've um, faced those cultural issues, what you've kind of in built in, in the team, and and what that journey was like. Yeah, I think I think in the early days of any any startup, it's all about you and the values you personally have, and and there are people sitting next to you. So therefore, it becomes very easy for everyone to understand what you care about and what this company is all about. As you kind of scale and you empower a leadership team, and you know you have a schedule of authority to empower people to make decisions on their own, and as you um, get into the hundreds of people. You have to kind of sit down and write down your personal values. You can't assume that people, you know, still tell the same stories on the floor. So, um, you know, we went through this phase of actually sitting down, you know, writing down our, our values. We've got three basic values and then we've got three behaviors under each value, which we call our ownership principles. Because ultimately, I aspire every single custodian to be an owner and to really own their area. I don't want to hold people accountable. I don't want to micromanage and I don't want to tell them be in the office by this and this exact you know, um, minute. I, ultimately, it's all about results. It's about empowering people and talent and celebrating the values we have. So we do you know, town halls once a quarter. We give ownership awards to people for epitomizing what we deeply care about. So for example, one plus one equals three. Uh, meaning that collaboration is at the heart of everything we do. Um, and we want to encourage people to do that. So we create stories so that people can tell stories about you know, what they've done to achieve, to live up to those values. We give them extra holidays to celebrate success and to in incentivize people. And, and so I think, I think just being extremely mindful of what you care about and how you then kind of create those stories that people tell, even as you scale to 400 people, um, that, that really matters the world. Of course, there's an onboarding booklet where we talk about our values, there are, you know, culture sessions and so on. Um, but yeah, it requires lots of hard work. I don't think we're perfect. We're probably doing a, an okay to decent job at it um, because we all massively believe that culture powers you know, it's all about people and people take initiative and initiative drives results. So it all starts with people and culture. So Timo, I, I love that bit. And it sounds like you've really put a lot of effort into thinking about the values. And actually, coincidentally, the last podcast I just recorded, I spoke a lot about values. Um, thinking about the staff then and kind of how that um, organizational structure works out. How, how did you, how did you look at that? Did you, um, put a lot of planning in there you know sometimes when you see companies it's it's very kind of top heavy in terms of management and things like that. did you did you have did you have to bring in some resource to help you plan that organizational chart through yeah i mean so we have um over time evolved um the organizational design and to be honest like it's constantly changing um 
because you always want to test and you want to see, you want to play to people's strengths. Um, but I don't think, I mean, it hasn't changed fundamentally. We always had a tech team. We always had a product team. We always had a marketing function. We always had an operations team and a finance team that's, you know, much smaller than any of the other teams. So I think the, the kind of direction of travel has always been the same. And then around the periphery, we've experimented. We've hired amazing people. We had interns that became, you know, team leaders managing 20 people um, and to empower them and to continuously uh, push their development and learning. You know, we, we constantly thought about giving them more responsibility or exposing them to different problems. So I, to, in my head, organizational design is a hugely dynamic topic and it requires constant evaluation and constant kind of assessment. Is it, is it you know, aligned with your strategy? Is it fit for purpose? Will it look totally different if you um, make certain strategic decisions? Um, so it's, I think it's one of the most important topics uh, when it comes to, to a company. It certainly is. That's why I asked that one because... I'm just I'm just amazed, you know, going from zero to four hundred in quite a short space of time. Um, yeah. You know, quite often you grow organically, and then you have to look back and think, "Wow, you know, we're three, four years down the line here. We're going to have to unwind and put these things in place." But did did, did you kind of understand what the growth was going to look like, and you put them in place first, so you grew nicely, or did you have to kind of look back and think, "I'm going to have to unwind a bit of this." <laughs> You no, know, I think I think um, I, I really, really, really value other people's advice, and I don't pretend that I figured everything out. Which means I, I listen to other people all day long, and I, I'm very blessed. I've got lots of mentors uh, and friends. I consult on those topics, so I always I think we've actually been ahead of the curve. And the the biggest I think decision in our journey has been to move away from uh, you know a founder that takes every little decision to a leadership team that's truly empowered. It's a high performance team. And on that team, every single per person has responsibility for the company beyond their function. So if I'm running operations, my main team is not operation. My number one team and my identity is, is I'm a member of the leadership team having a responsibility for the entire company and for its decision making. Secondly, I'm then, of course, a part of the operations team, uh, my second identity. But kind of, uh, you know, high performance teams look amazing on the outside. They're really hard work on the inside. Uh, and we've we've done tremendous work with coaches, writing down our team charter, our, our purpose, you know, giving each other green and red cards for certain behavior <laughs> to just get better and better and better at, at instant feedback. But I think it's this mentality. you got to evolve all the time and get better as a group of people so that you have psychological safety, you have trust, you know, you, you have the ability and humility to challenge each other in a, in a highly kind of constructive way. Um, and then as a second phase, once, once we had the leadership team, um, we then heavily focused on building a management team under the leadership team, comprising 14 people now, so plus six people on the leadership team, um, that really, really, really take a responsibility, not just for execution, but for people and people engagement. So we run quarterly surveys on people engagement, culture, and every single one of those 14 management team members, you know, owns the engagement score of their team and sits down with the team after the survey to dis decide how to improve engagement, culture, what actions can they take, what, you know, what are the issues. Um, and then obviously centrally, we've got a talent function that's, that's helping. Um, but I think it's, it's really kind of obsessing not just about results, but about the how and the right behaviors and, and, you know, setting an example and really kind of instilling this into a wider set of people, not just, you know, your CFO and the CEO, but 20 people that then drive the business forward. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. I, I could listen to you all day on that one. It's a real passion of mine. It's, uh, I can tell you. Yeah. yeah. No, good it's, questions. it's so reassuring. So basically what we're seeing there is Timo that, you know, every quarter we're kind of keeping an eye on the staff and making sure we're taking along. Has that, impacted on staff turnover then timo do you, do you lose many people is there a churn there 
Yeah, I mean, look, every single function is different. Um, so, for example, if you look at um, Spalding in Lincolnshire, where we run a large uh, food factory, the topics are completely different, right? Brexit matters a lot more um, because X percent of people are coming from Europe to work in the UK and they've lived in the UK for five to 10 years. But Brexit obviously scares people. So that's a big topic. Um, uh, salary is a much more sensitive topic. Uh, because if you work in a factory, you're most likely earn less than if you were, uh, if you had a PhD in machine learning and you worked in in, uh, in a tech function. So I think it what really matters is um, kind of segmenting your employees' needs and understanding what kind of the common denominators by team are, and then uh, having an employer. Uh, brand that kind of caters towards those um, core needs to give you one other example i mean it's a really dumb example but if i'm 22 years old and you tell me hey um we're paying 20 percent pension i don't care right like pension is so far out that's that doesn't matter that much to me but if if you know if i've got um if I'm a developer in a tech function and you tell me that I get 10% of my time, I can allocate to whatever I want to work on and I can, uh, can kind of explore new technologies, that's amazing. I love that. And, you know, if, if I can then drink beer in the office and have breakfast, that's even better. So I think it, it, sounds, it sounds a bit silly, but it's a really, really serious and important point. I think un just understanding, slicing and dicing kind of your employee um, base and, and understanding the needs and then coming up with a strategy to um, make sure you maximize happiness across your company, I think is, is kind of the secret sauce. And we are immensely um, high growth. Um, we've hired over 100 people since beginning of the year. Um, so yeah, the, the big challenge is how do you onboard people? How do you retain the same culture? How do you not lose velocity and so on? It's um, it's immensely fun, but it's also challenging at that speed. Yeah, it, and it's a great example you gave there. That is actually a great takeaway. It's not a one-size-fits-all. There are different challenges and different motivations and inspirations from very different um, you know, yeah. um, generations in a, in a workplace. So thanks for sharing that. So, Timo, what's next, my friend? What does the vision look like? World domination or what? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think recognizing that a billion meals are eaten in the UK on a weekly basis alone, which is mind-blowing, we are scratching the surface. Today is day one, uh, and we haven't achieved much at this greater scheme of things. So to me, um, the most powerful thing you can do is is to just double down, uh, focus, and and really, really, really obsess about building tech and operational capabilities over the next three years that then allow us to build a consumer proposition that no one else in the world has built or dreamed of building um, that then really changes your life and millions of people's lives for the better while it's kind of safeguarding the, the food waste mission. So in a way, it's more of the same, but it's quite radical. You see huge, huge change coming from a consumer point of view. Um, every single kind of roadmap starts with what customers actually want. Uh, and then how we deliver this to customers. And given kind of the, the magnitude um, of change, we're now thinking kind of two, three years out, the, the roadmaps are getting longer. You know, we, we're now uh, thinking about 2020 factory capacity. And so just the thinking is getting a lot more long-term, a lot more strategic, but the, the direction of travel is exactly the same true customer obsession and going deeper and deeper and deeper leveraging technology to deliver up on that promise um so yeah i know expect a lot of fun uh, coming out in the next couple of years should be really good for customers a fantastic answer i didn't you know it could have been yes ian is world domination or europe or, or the uk but actually <laughs> you know you've actually kept your feet on the ground there and you're doing things structured with real purpose and my mind is, is sitting thinking about your boardroom. It's sitting thinking about your management dashboards and your KPIs. I expect you guys are all over that kind of stuff, yeah? We absolutely are. Um, I, uh, I, I, I am a data geek. I do like data. Um, I'm, I'm very blessed. I have a wonderful wife who's a neuroscientist and, you know, with a PhD. And so she's, she's the smart person in the family. And she early on kind of... Um, 
opened my eyes to the possibilities of what we can do if we empower data scientists into the business model from day one when we didn't have any legacy issues. So since day one, we've built systems uh, and data warehouses and architecture that you know fulfills the purpose of, of empowering the entire business uh, with with daily, hourly, you know, uh, data. So literally every single aspect of the business has data against it, which I think is the best way to to create meritocracy and truly empower people, because it means that I don't have to call up the person running the factory. I know exactly what's happening by simply opening an email on an hourly basis that kind of shows me, you know, I don't know, food waste or quality issues on my potato intake or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, no, I absolutely think if you want to build an amazing business, an amazing consumer proposition, it's all about understanding data and having the humility, you know, to react quite quite fast to data, and not just having conviction. I totally agree because some of those decisions around the board table and at management level, you've actually got the data to back them up. It's not just a gut feel or someone's opinion. You can actually point to the data and say, no, 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 this is how it's going, guys. <laughs> Yeah, it's not just my crazy kind of um, idea back then. Uh, yeah, no, uh, now we have people, grown-up people, having data in their hands and saying, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, fantastic. So, Timo, uh, where can we find you? If somebody wants to know more about Gusto or maybe yourself, where could we get a hold of you? I mean, most importantly, uh, you know, gusto.co.uk, amazing recipes. Please, please try and give us some honest feedback. Um, I myself, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I stopped using Facebook and Twitter, but I'm very active on LinkedIn and I'd love to, to meet people on LinkedIn and, and connect and hear, hear other people's stories. Uh, and obviously we're hiring dozens and dozens of roles, um, both in Lincolnshire and London. Uh, and we'd love for people to Fantastic apply. Fantastic stuff. So if they went on to, was it gusto.co.uk? Yes. Yeah. And they could sign up and what they would get the recipe boxes delivered to the homes, yeah? Yep. At an amazing price point, you know, the most choice, the, the fastest delivery, free delivery. Um, genuinely, genuinely keen for people to try and give us honest feedback and let the product speak for itself. Fantastic stuff. So, Timo, uh, this leaves me to thank you so much for your time today. It's been so interesting to hear your journey and I will watch you with great interest. Thank you so much, Ian. Really, really enjoyed the session. Thanks for your time. All the best. Thanks to Timo there. I really enjoyed that. And what a coincidence. Last week, I was talking about values and writing them down and basing your, co you're basing your company on those. Well, doesn't it sound like that's what Timo and his colleagues have done? Amazing stuff. And just before I left there, I said to Timo, that I'd worked with some really large corporations and I hadn't heard of any of them that committed to the cause that Gusto are. So when it comes to culture, those guys are absolutely crushing it. So well done, Gusto, and thanks so much to Timo. I hope you enjoyed that. Keep in touch. Let me know the usual channels. So until next time, I'm Ian Farah. This is the Industry Angel, and thanks for listening.